Welcome back everyone to episode two of this series on surgeries. I'm your host, Julian, and before we get into today's episode, I wanna say if you haven't heard episode one on the history of surgeries and anesthesia, definitely go back and listen. We talk about drilling holes and skulls and how we don't know how general anesthesia works, which is a bit surprising. Really fun stuff. On this episode, we're going to cover some specific surgeries and we're able to cover this topic on Seeker Plus because, well, it's a podcast. We don't really have to show exactly what's happening. And that's good if you're squeamish, kind of like me, and, uh, well, for the channel because otherwise we'd probably get flagged and this episode would get taken down. Oh, and while we're at it, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and you know what? Don't forget to enjoy. Enjoy this as we talk about how people cut open other people and either take things out of them or put things into them. Now, today we're going to get into some specific surgeries, get more detailed on exactly what's happening, because I feel like medicine has come so far, actually we know it has if you listen to the first episode, and yet we take for granted how amazing some of this stuff truly is when you break it down. So I'd like to talk about one of the most common surgeries, one of the most advanced surgeries, and maybe one of the more complicated ones. And just for fun, I'm gonna throw in a favorite of mine that I found along the way, like one of the longest surgeries. It took place in 1951, it lasted 96 hours, and it removed an ovarian cyst. Part of why it took so long was because they had to drain 200 pounds of fluid from the cyst before removing it. Fun. Okay, so let's first start with one of the most common surgeries in the world, but one that's far from simple. And actually it's kind of makes me squeamish when I talk about it. Again, really glad we don't have to show these. I'm talking about cataract removal. Yeah. We're gonna talk about eyeballs and sticking needles in them. By some estimates, there are more than three million cataract surgeries per year in just the United States. And you're probably asking yourself, what is a cataract? Well, you probably know what it is, but not really what it is. So I'll explain. It's one of the leading causes of blindness in the world. It happens when basically your eye gets cloudy because some proteins start to clump together in the lens. The lens is part of the eye that helps you to focus so you can you know, C. So as these proteins break down and clump together, that obviously makes it so you can't see. Doctors compare it to looking through a frosted window. Now, I won't get too much into it because this is a series about surgery, not the eye, but we can do one on the eye. It's really cool how the eye works. Obviously, cataract surgery is a way to remove that cataract so you don't go blind. Well, how is this done? Well, one of the most popular ways to remove a cataract is with a needle sound waves, and a vacuum. I'm not kidding, it sounds so sci-fi. First, surgeons cut an opening in your eye, one big enough for a needle tool to get in. Now, I say needle tool, but it's not really a needle because folks, it is so much more than that. Once this tool is in your eye, it emits ultrasound waves inside your eyeball. And these ultrasound waves actually break up or emulsify the proteins. This same tool then suctions all of them out of your eye. After this, they put in a new artificial lens and it's done. So to repeat, they cut your eyeball, stick a probe into it, blast some sound waves around inside and then <laughs> suck out the clouds. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. I just love the idea that surgery can be something like this, not necessarily opening someone up, removing something and then sewing them back together. This is using sound waves to solve a problem. It's kind of like doing eye surgery with lasers, which, oh yeah, of course is a thing. LASIK reshapes your cornea with a laser to make you see better, which obviously much better than a doctor just doing it with their fingers like a potter with clay on a pottery wheel. Okay, so needles and eyeballs, tough to think about. I'm gonna stop saying it. Let's take it up a notch. Let's talk about stopping your heart and then sewing something taken out of your leg into it to make it healthier. This, my friends, is coronary artery bypass surgery. It's an open heart surgery, meaning that surgeons have to open the chest wall to get to the heart, as opposed to closed heart surgery where they can go in through a smaller incision. With coronary artery bypass surgery, they also have to stop the heart. Now, I wanted to talk about this surgery because like cataract surgery, it seems pretty common. I mean, heart disease is the leading cause of death in America year after year. I've heard the term bypass surgery and open heart surgery my whole life, but I never really understood exactly what they involved. So 
I thought it'd be fun to get into all of the bloody details. But like, bloody with a, a good outcome in the end, you know, a, a positive bloody. Okay, so briefly, why would someone need this surgery? Well, when one of the arteries to your heart gets clogged or blocked, it's not good. It decreases blood flow to your heart, can lead to a heart attack, and that could be fatal, which, again, not good. So we need a way to fix that. How do we do that? We bypass the clogged arteries with a new, healthy, unclogged one from another part of your body. This surgery can also be used for going around arteries afflicted with other issues. But before we can do any of that, doctors have to cut open your chest with a sternotomy. It's also called cracking the chest, which is just the grossest three-word phrase I've ever heard. After surgeons crack that chest, they go harvesting for veins. Again, this whole thing is being done because of a blocked or clogged artery. Doctors need to find a new one to add to that oh-so-important heart. The main veins used for this come from either your arm, leg, or the preferred choice, the internal mammary artery in the chest. Now, this is a preferred choice because unlike the veins in the arm and leg, the mammary artery is, well, an artery. It means it'll hold up better once grafted onto the heart. The other thing is, it's right there, right near the heart. You don't have to take it out of a limb and put it in the chest. You just move over a little bit and, oh, okay, what a surprise, there it is. Special thanks, by the way, to our editor, Matt's dad, for this information. It was really difficult sifting through complicated medical papers to research this, so we reached out to Seeger Plus's official cardiologist. Uh, Matt, can you put a, a picture of your, your dad up here? In the, oh, there. Thanks. Thanks, Matt's dad. Thank you. I've never met Matt's dad, so I actually I don't know if this is really a picture of him or not, but we're going to trust Matt on that. Okay, moving on. Once we've got that replacement vein, it's time to stop the heart doctors will inject the heart with a chemical agent called cardioplegia, and it'll put the heart into a rest. It'll stop beating, which makes it much easier to work on. You wouldn't want to work on your car engine while it's running. The solution is also cold. It cools down the heart, and helps protect the tissue during surgery. But if the heart is stopped, won't that kill the patient and you know, kind of achieve the opposite of what we're going for? Not if you're using a handy-dandy heart-lung machine that'll help keep blood circulated and oxygenated. Why is it called a heart-lung machine? Thanks for asking. In a normal, healthy person, oxygenated blood is pumped out of the heart and goes throughout their body, dropping off oxygen and nutrients along the way. Then this oxygen-depleted blood goes back into the heart, which directs it into the lungs, it gets oxygen back, and the process repeats. So, in order to ensure that oxygenated blood is still keeping the body you know, alive, doctors hook up two tubes to the heart. One takes deoxygenated blood out. It's fed into the machine and oxygenated. Then it's fed into the second tube and put back into the heart and pumped throughout the body. Really fascinating stuff. Okay, so now the patient is knocked out, they're cut open, and their heart is still empty and cold, just like my ex's. This is when surgeons can finally sew on a new artery to bypass the clogged one. They sew one end of the new vein or artery right below the block section, and the other end into the aorta. So now the blood will literally just bypass that section and deliver that sweet, sweet blood uninterrupted. Once that's all set, doctors will get the blood flowing, take the patient off the blood pumping machine, and sew them back up. I want to say, I love taking deep dives into this, because even the simple version of this surgery is impressive. Open heart surgery. But... Then you get into the details about cooling liquids and stealing veins and blood pumping machines. It, it just makes you appreciate it that much more. Okay, I wanted to end with a surgery that always makes the list of longest surgeries or most complicated surgeries, and that is separating conjoined twins. The problem is we can't really break down step by step how this procedure happens like we did with the previous surgeries because it really is a case by case thing. It depends on how the twins are connected. That all comes down to if they share important organs or veins. For instance, if twins shared a heart, there'd be no way to separate them. The process of becoming a conjoined twin happens in the womb. It's when a fertilized egg starts to split to make identical twins. But if the split happens too late, it doesn't happen all the way. Some also think that eggs can come back together at some point during the pregnancy. Doctors can see this on ultrasounds and can start making plans for surgery even before the twins are born. A lot of separation surgeries are done on babies and toddlers depending on what's safe. Which brings us to the first step in separation, making sure that survival is possible. 
If doctors are confident in that, they can start with expanding the skin at the point of separation to make the separation easier. This involves surgically putting balloons under the skin and slowly filling them up so the body creates more skin. Then, before the surgery, doctors can take the balloons out. Now they have more stuff to work with after the procedure. And because these procedures are so complicated, it usually takes a huge team to ensure success. In one example from 2011, a pair of twins were connected at the head, and doctors were worried about one twin having too few veins in the head after the separation. So, they did 3D modeling and computer animation to test out the scenarios. Then, a team of 15 doctors and surgeons worked on a series of operations to separate them, including expanding the skin and bone in the head with those balloons we mentioned. The longest surgery in the world was separating twins joined the head. It took doctors 103 hours to do the job. You see that in a lot of these surgeries, 12 hours to separate twins in Israel with 50 doctors and, of course, 3D modeling and months of planning, 24 hours and 30 surgeons to separate twins at UC Davis in California, again, with all hands on deck to separate, connect veins, do blood transfusions, reconstruct skulls and tissue. There are so many of these stories, and each of them involves months and months of planning well before the babies are even born. Using high-tech equipment and some of the most skilled surgeons in the world working sometimes days on end is quite remarkable and probably one of the most challenging things to do in an operating room. So those are a few surgery explainers, and oh, I wish we had time for more. There are so many things we didn't get to talk about, like time surgeons have had to operate on themselves, or theories on head transplants, or how we put animal parts inside humans, and face transplants. There's just so much stuff. But alas, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for tuning in to Seeker Plus. I'm your host, Julian Huguet. If you like this series, make sure you like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe. We'll be making a lot more of these going forward. So please let us know what topics you want us to cover. We can really talk about anything. Just drop it in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.